You're tuned to 1520 WCAT Radio, and it's time now for the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will offer reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today, and now Sam Hankin. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Avid Reader. Today, our guest is Charles Seif, author of Virtual Unreality. Just because the Internet told you, how do you know it's true? That's its subtitle. It's published this June by Viking. Charles is also the, also the author of Proofiness, Sun in a Bottle, Decoding the Universe, Alpha and Omega, and Zero, the Biography of a Dangerous Idea, which is my favorite. And here are all cut and paste from Amazon, one of Charles' pet peeves. More about that later. Zero, Infinity's Twin, is not like other numbers. It is both nothing and everything. And that concept has always fascinated me. Uh, Charles holds a mathematics degree from Princeton, uh, MS in mathematics from Yale, and an MS in journalism from Columbia. He uh, used to write for science and new scientist before joining the Department of Journalism at the New York University, um, NYU. Virtual Unreality is a book about information, its immediate flash throughout the world, and the fact that information itself is no longer a scarce commodity. It's ubiquitous and instantaneous, which gives rise to its unfortunate cauldron for unreliability. Anybody can mess with your Wikipedia entry. Anyone can set up a Facebook page for you anytime. Um, anyone, as Charles talks about, can cut and paste copy and use it to pretend it's journalism. Anyone can use a sock puppet, which Charles will explain and pose as an independent source. So here to tell us, give us information, is, and welcome, Charles. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Well, so, so why are we so susceptible to disinformation now as opposed to the disinformation we've been subject to in the past of our history? Well, digital information has some really interesting properties that we've never encountered before. Um, the act of copying something uh, is instantaneous and sudden and perfect in a way that it could never be before. If you think about it, the, the term copyright relies on the fact that it is you are able to control the right to copy your work. Um, and it used to be that if you wrote a book, um, uh, you'd be limited by the fact that someone had to have a printing press to produce it. Um, whereas nowadays, uh, digital information can be copied over the internet uh, with a a uh, handheld computer instantly with perfect fidelity and this has all sorts of implications that we really are just beginning to grapple with well, uh, for example um, the 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 very fact that you can copy something and move it instantly around the world means that uh, if I write something and put it out there um, someone else can take exactly the same thing within seconds and put it out there and alter it and change it on their own. And if they've got a bigger audience, what they have done to my original work uh, can be drowned out uh, uh, by them. Uh, they, 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 can, they can overwhelm me. So I might be the one who actually possesses the information, understands it, and has created it. And someone else who just has a, uh, a bigger pipe, has a, has a um, bigger loudspeaker, can change and dwarf what I used to say, what, what I was saying. Well, you know, before I read your book, I kind of felt safe with Wikipedia, and you talk about Wikipedia a lot, and I really relied on it to a certain extent. But after reading your book, uh, it became, due to your explanation, fairly obvious that total fabrication can occur, can be corrected by the person who knows what that fabrication is, and then reoccur in seconds. Um, how, how do you how do you talk to say students about using Wikipedia as a source for their own you know work their reports and things like that? Well, I I, I tell them first that it's it's surprising that Wikipedia is actually as good as it is. It's actually a decent resource for our first glance at a subject, often. But I warn them at the same time that's all it's good for. Uh, that it is a, a first look that leads you to other places because, uh, again, of this property of digital information. Anyone can alter it. Anyone can change it. Um, some guy in his basement can wipe out what a nuclear physicist writes about nuclear fusion and 
replace it. And it becomes the canonical copy uh, that everyone around the world is seeing, that there is no one who decides. So there, there, there isn't a easy way for people to decide who has the knowledge that is valid and who, which it isn't. So Wikipedia is a chaotic, democratic mess, hmm. um, which means that some entries are better than others. Uh, some entries are really terrible. Some entries are propaganda meant to deceive you. Um, you find corporations uh, mucking around Wikipedia trying to alter their uh, how they're perceived, or Congress people who are uh, altering the Wikipedia pages of their their own uh, of, of their their own Wikipedia pages or the Wikipedia pages of their rivals uh, to try to help spin things. So. Uh, by giving everyone access, which on one level is a good thing, uh, it also gives access to people who have an agenda, and it's a much stronger uh, access than could ever be done before. Uh, well, if you compare the Encyclopedia Britannica, you had editors who were controlling uh, the production, and it would take years, and um, if you were lucky enough to get included in the Britannica, you'd see your stuff sit there for years unchanged. Um, Wikipedia has changed all that because anyone can change it. It's funny because as a somewhat of a lark, I looked at your Wikipedia entry, which is somewhat spotty, and I thought, I wonder why Charles doesn't go in and fill it in with the things he's done, more information about the book Zero. And it's funny because it was just, you know, like half a page. And I'm sure you've looked at it. But oh, yeah, I've looked at it. It's filled with errors. Actually. <laughs> and and it's... It, uh, it's not. It's not. It's not written very well. Like the one you talk about. You know. You know. It wasn't from your friend because he would have written it better. Yeah. In fact, you know, the thing is, it because of this propaganda element, it is strongly discouraged by Wikipedia to alter your own pages or to uh, change things that affect you that where you have a conflict of interest. Of course, uh, not everyone obeys that rule. Uh, I, I have chosen actually not to alter my Wikipedia page uh, because it would be a little bit hypocritical for me to do that. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, a lot of the stuff is um, borderline incoherent. And you, you see biographies of living people who, which, where you have stuff which is actually libelous. Um, uh, you, you, the, uh, uh, you have an enemy altering a, a news anchor's page saying that he, he was involved in something or other, and, and it, it winds up uh, being published uh, in a semi-well-regarded source, and it can become true. What Tell that story about back before all of this in the 19th century when the rumor went around and ruined the guy's life that he had died. Yes, Jonathan Swift. Uh, was, Who I love. Uh, a brilliant satirist, and he, he, he was annoyed at a fortune teller astrologer named Isaac Bickerstaff. Uh, and uh, what he did was he, he, he went, uh, he published a prediction, um, uh, uh, false, uh, jokingly predicting the death of this astrologer he hated. And then once the day came around, he uh, had several different reports published of the death of the astrologer, thereby confirming that it happened. And so by having multiple sources all confirming something which was false, uh, he started a, a, a rumor around town, and it became a, a, a joke among the literati that this, this astrologer had died, and yet he was still walking around. And he was embarrassed all the time. Yes. <laughs> that was what he, was so funny. It's a huge embarrassment, and he, he kept, uh, the, uh, apparently people had been sending pallbearers to uh, collect bills from him, his uh, supposed widow, etc. So it was, it, was, it was kind of a cruel joke, but it was, it was very funny, and it was very clever in that Swift did it by um, creating multiple accounts which slightly differed from one another, so it gave it the, the feeling of authenticity, even though it was all from the same source. Uh, it seemed like it came from half a dozen people, and therefore it was believable. And it, the rumor actually uh, gained a lot of strength. Well, you know, it's funny because a corollary of that is like when you're hired as a, let me call it, as a fixer, and you go in to research someone who all of a sudden you realize and vet and find out that he's been writing the same thing to tell one of those stories, writing the same thing over and over and getting yeah. away with it. Oh yeah, yeah, and it, it, you, you 
you can um, usually, I mean, the, you, you can tell the skill of some uh, a, a faker uh, by how how uh, how easily you can see through the fact that it's, it's one person by by uh, looking at language and uh, I've, this happens all the time in Amazon reviews uh, because the authors are notoriously thin skinned about uh, uh, getting people to complain about their books and uh, it turns out a good proportion of, of book reviews on, on Amazon.com are, are fake uh, I. Back in my first book, I, I, I found a sock puppet who was writing review after review, negative reviews of me, and I detected it because of a really strange quirk in punctuation. So uh, that punctuation quirk uh, signaled that it was really a single person. But smart people, people who are actively trying to deceive, are able to create a whole army of fake supporters that seem to create an illusion of reality when in fact it's just one person uh, on his own trying to uh, attack somebody. Uh, yeah, and then when you have a scientist, uh, and you know, in your other books you talk about cold fusion and those kinds of things, but if you have a scientist who decides, you know, I think I can get away with this, and basically this all boils down to con control C and control V. That's right. That's what the uh, world is. Uh, plagiarism um, and uh, photoshopping, actually one of the right. biggest problems in, in scientific literature right now is um, faked what are called Western blots, which are which are uh, tests done to to look at what proteins are in a certain uh, uh, concoction of cells, and so what people are doing is they're cutting and pasting these little lines which determine where your proteins are and putting them elsewhere. So it, they're making up from whole cloth um, scientific results which they never did. And so that they're claiming they ran tests that they never did. They're finding things that never happened. And all because of Photoshop, it's almost impossible to tell the difference unless you use some sophisticated forensic tools. It reminds me of uh, my classic one, which is George Bush getting off after he f fake flew the jet, and it said mission accomplished. And then when things went downhill, that mission accomplished was no longer on, that banner was no longer on the side of the ship. That's right. I mean, government. The, this this sort of thing goes way back. Uh, I mean, the, the, the Stalin era has a, 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 a has a reputation for airbrushing yeah. uh, uh, people one by one out of photographs. So it's, the 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 fact that photographs can be faked and altered isn't new. Was it was it Iraq or Iran that you were talking about with the missile? Tell that it was one. Iran. It was Iran, and uh, they had a missile launch where you had. Uh, they launched five <laughs> missiles, and uh, they celebrated and set, put this uh, uh, picture up on the wires. And people very quickly detected that the fifth missile was photoshopped, and that the fourth missile, actually, the fifth missile, actually failed to launch. And so what they did was they c created some composite uh, of the previous missiles to make it look like there was a fifth missile, and people detected it. And what happened was pe because people in the United States and uh, and uh, England were really uh, very skilled at Photoshop. They created scenes with that same photograph that were more realistic than what Iran had put out. They they photoshopped in uh, X-wing fighters and uh, all sorts of uh, superheroes and, and strange stuff, but it all looked more realistic and more professionally done than what Iran had done. And that kind of underscores what's really different is that it used to take the skills and money and time and effort and expertise of a nation state to try to fake things on a large scale. Now, if you buy a computer, you spend a thousand dollars, spend some time playing around with Photoshop, you can do a pretty decent job on your own. And it's funny because uh, the nation became ridiculed because of their amateurish job. And it, that harkens back to Jonathan Swift because you know, they're, they thought they were putting up something that was going to make them seem all that, and it turns out they get laughed at um, because of the amateurish way in which they went about it. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, I think the headline was, uh, Iran, you suck at Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it's funny, I, I have this open mic night, and I put together posters, and I did Photoshop one, and my little girl comes in and she goes, Wow, Dad, that's a really lousy job of photoshopping. And then I felt horrible too because I'm not that good at it either. Um, well, you know, if I played devil's advocate though with regard to information, 
if you take say that you take the War of 1812, the Treaty of Ghent signed and the war is over. Yet Andrew Jackson doesn't know it, so he fights the Battle of New Orleans, and all these people are killed. If he had an iPhone, he would have known the war was over, and he would have saved a lot of lives. So there is another side to it, right? Oh, absolutely. The, inter- the internet, I mean, even before the internet, the, the transmission of information through electric signals or uh, using light means that you are no longer shackled to carrying information on your backs, which is what was true in the War of 1812. You, you, there was no way to get a message from England to the United States except by boat, and it would take weeks for the boat to get across. Um, so there's no question that these revolutions in um, communications have changed our entire world for the better, that uh, you can communicate with people all across the world, that all, you have exposure to all sorts of different peoples and cultures and ideas that you never did before. Um, so there's no question that the Internet is a great thing in many ways. It just, with the increase in our powers for good, there's also the increase in our powers to deceive each other. And uh, we haven't really fully grappled with all of the implications of this amazing technology that we invented. Well, I, the other, you know, the other one I was thinking of was when, during the Revolutionary War, with Thomas Jefferson uh, in Paris collecting what would be a great wine collection, and Benjamin Franklin eating as much as he could, and John Adams going to the Hague to try and raise money for us. If they if they got a message, and they wanted to reply, it's going to either take weeks, or a pirate's going to take it, or a, a storm will take it, and the whole course of the war could, you know, it's almost amazing that it actually was able to happen. Yeah. Uh, I mean, serendipity uh, played a huge role yeah. in, in, in you often had a, a single courier running with a very important message, and uh, if it got through, great. If it was intercepted, you were in trouble. Um, that's, that's always been true with war, but I, I think in some ways, um, well, you can, you can say that in some ways the, the risk has been reduced, but in other ways the risk has been increased. Because everybody, uh, everybody knows it instantaneously. That's right. Everyone knows things instantaneously, and if something doesn't get through, you can try again. If your email bounces, uh, you generally know it's it something has uh, happened, and you can you can try again. So uh, if you're, it's, it's not like having your carrier pigeon shot down. <laughs> that doesn't happen as much anymore. But at the same time, um, generally speaking, you don't necessarily know when people are eavesdropping or intercepting uh, your messages, which was easier to detect in the days of uh, wax seals and uh, paper uh, bulletins. Um, uh, Once we went to electronic transmission, this includes telephones, it was easier to intercept and listen in without being detected. My favorite one is is the Greeks, how they would um, shave a slave's head and then tattoo a message on his head, let his hair grow back in, send him abroad, and then they would shave his head and read the message. Yeah, yeah, there were all sorts of tricks. I mean, I, I think it was it was actually in Herodotus where uh, there was a they used a wax tablet, um, took the wax off, inscribed something underneath, and put the wax back on. So there was always an attempt to try to get things through and not just uh, uh, hide it from other people's eyes, but uh, to figure out if it, it if it's intercepted. And I think that was easier. If, if the messenger was was captured, you'd probably know it. What about the, the, the opposite thing? Talk about something silly, like the billions of people who have gotten that letter from Nigeria. Um, I don't even have to explain it. Everybody's gotten it. And how you talk about it, it's not the question of its stupidity. It's the question of somebody out of these billions of people who buys it. Yeah. That, what, one of the things about the Nigerian scam is, I mean, it, it's, it's hard if you look around your friends. How many of your friends have fallen for it? I don't think you can think of Maybe you have a very, very gullible friend somewhere, but most people don't know someone who's, who's fallen for these scams. But you get so many of these, and uh, they do actually succeed uh, on occasion. That, that it's certainly profitable enough um, with the occasional sucker that uh, this is a huge industry. Um, and one of the secrets behind this is that the internet has made it so cheap and so easy to mass produce communications. You don't have to aim for a scheme which is sophisticated to get 
one in ten people or one in a hundred people or even one in a thousand people. You've got something which is so goofy that only one in a hundred thousand uh, falls for it. It doesn't matter if you send out 300 million emails, then you're going to get thousands of hits. Well, talk about something that everybody fell for, which is how you begin the book. And I was like incredulous because I, I didn't know about it, which is Bert the Muppet and what happened with that. Yeah, uh, this was uh, it, right after September 11th in, in October uh, 2001. Um, there were these rallies, these anti-American rallies, which were beginning to form around the, uh, the world. Uh, you had some in Bangladesh. Uh, you had uh, some in Indonesia. And um, when the protesters were looking for signs uh, to put up to praise Osama bin Laden, uh, they were looking for people who photographs to put on these posters. So you had a couple of poster shops uh, creating pro-Osama bin Laden posters festooned with pictures of Osama bin Laden. And AP... Uh, photographers and other news photographers were covering these rallies and taking snapshots of these angry people carrying these posters. And then a few days later, someone noticed in the corner of uh, the poster, just right behind Osama bin Laden's uh, shoulder, was a picture of Bert. <laughs> Bert the Muppet, the yellow pointy-headed Muppet, looking kind of <laughs> rowly, evilly looking over Osama bin Laden's shoulders, if he were uh, Osama bin Laden's most trusted advisor. And it, it became kind of this, this sensation where a lot of people were uh, associating the Muppets with, with uh, uh, Al-Qaeda all of a sudden, and, and Bert, Bert is evil uh, became a reality. Um, what happened was... When searching for a photograph of Osama bin Laden, the, the poster makers naturally turned to the Internet. And they found a picture of Osama bin Laden, which was actually uh, housed on a satire website called Bert is Evil. And in Bert is Evil, they had photoshopped Bert into all sorts of uh, places in history, like you had him at the grassy knoll, or you had him squatting, discussing things with Paul Pot. Uh, and the point was to kind of make him this evil influence over history. And, of course, they had one with Osama bin Laden. And the, uh, the poster makers just copied that photograph, not, knowing that, not noticing that there was a Muppet over the guy's shoulder. And this kind of cutesy idea of Bert being evil and watching over uh, bad moments in history suddenly kind of became real. Uh, Bert was associated with... Uh, an anti-American rally in Al-Qaeda, and the, the owner of the Bird is Evil website got so freaked out that he, he ended the site. He stopped uh, uh, photoshopping Bird because he, it, it got too close to home. It, it was too real for him. I felt bad for him. I mean, he didn't really mean anything. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, yeah, it's just his, li his life could have been ruined because, you know, how could he do this? But he didn't really do anything bad. It's just every, yeah. everything gets caught up. And that's, I think, a, a big part of the premise of your book is that when something goes viral, like it goes viral now, whether it's a dancing cat, as you say, or, or that kid who, um, you know, the, the kung fu kid. Talk about that one a little bit. Yeah. Uh, at one point, there was, a, there was a, a teenager in a Canadian high school who went into a um, video room in his class, in, in a school and was playing around with special effects and so what he did was he took a a pole and was swinging it around uh <laughs> and uh videotaped it uh, uh it was kind of a very silly little self-portrait movie and uh, i'm sure he didn't mean it for anyone else to see it but he, he apparently left the videotape in uh the machine and what happened was people took the videotape digitized it put it on the internet and photoshopped all sorts of uh, effect on it, so it looked like he was a, a, a Jedi Knight swinging this uh, lightsaber around instead of a pole. And the poor kid was comically inept. He was just falling all over the place and superimposed with these high-tech effects and the uh, uh, dramatic John Williams uh, soundtrack. It became a viral hit. And this poor guy was, was completely humiliated. But there is a point, though. It's like P.T. Barnum or whoever said it, you know, I, I don't 
care what you what you say as long as you say something about me. And he became kind of famous for his 15 minutes, and maybe he was happy because of that. I don't know. Like that, that kid who did that um, Dragonista song way back when, which started a lot of this stuff. But it's funny what what's um, interesting and probably the worst thing that's happening that you talk about is, and it I can understand it a little bit, but these they're reporters who no longer are reporters because they don't seek an independent source or a secondary sec- uh, source, and they just cut and paste a source or an article, and then it's, like you said, it's, um, what, do you, what do you call it? It becomes ca- can- canonical. Can- I don't, I can't canonical, yeah. Yeah, it becomes canonical. And, but the other side of the, this is that they're like being slave-driven. They're ordered to produce six or seven stories a day, and they can't do it without doing it this way. Yeah, there's a vicious cycle going on because of the speed of information, the ease of copying, that um, some of the big sites have figured out that it is much more difficult and expensive to produce your own um, news and to get your reporters gathering news than it is to let other people break the news. But as soon as it's broken, you very quickly react and cut and paste their story or just tweak it a little bit and republish it uh, in a way that will get a little bit more attention than the original. And so you have this um, ecosystem of primary news reporters who are reporting the news and then these parasites who are repackaging other people's news more cheaply and getting more web traffic often than the originals. So in some ways, the parasites are getting more than the originals. And so it makes no economic sense to be someone who's producing those. If you do the parasitism well, you can make a better living than if you, if you spend all the money on, on reporters. So what has happened is uh, more and more sites are relying on this uh, method of just spend as much time as you can copying other people's stuff, get throw all these stories out there, get a lot of web traffic, and repeat. Um, and this means that reporters signing on to these um, uh, places are, are increasingly pressured to try to do similar things, put out six, seven, eight stories a day. Uh, Washington Post advertised for someone who's going to be doing uh, a dozen blog posts in a, in a day. Um, and unfortunately, if you're doing a dozen blog posts, if you're, if you're taking less than uh, an hour, half an hour to do each one, there's no way you can do any reporting. There's no way you can speak to people, much less uh, go outside to a scene of, of a crime or, or, or interview somebody who was an eyewitness. So you're stuck uh, copying other people's stuff, and, so, and this, this cycle continues, and uh, it doesn't seem to be stopping. What's, what was most troubling about that section of your book was the aura of plausible deniability that these reporters had, like the one woman who copied directly from a press release. And even as you said, that's not really plagiarism. She said she wasn't trying to plagiarize, but nonetheless... When she wrote it, it then became the word, and the word was God. You know, it's like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, the, the norms in journalism are changing as well. It, it, it's, um, I, I t- have a class of science journalism students, and every year at the beginning of the class, just to depress them, <laughs> uh, I, I take a news story, a major news story that's broken in uh, a number of ways, and you have 12, 14 outlets who've covered this story in different ways. And you will find nowadays that maybe three or four of those 14, 15 outlets did original reporting. The rest were more or less uh, copying a press release. Uh, this would always happen, this would happen years back, but it's it, the proportion of uh, news outlets, which are just relying on press releases, is, is definitely going up, and it's it's a scary uh, 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 development because that means that people, the people who are interested in uh, how they're portrayed and in, in, in having the coverage, are 
altering the news in their favor. And this kind of goes back to the Wikipedia problem. It's funny, you know, I wouldn't say this, but for the fact that you introduced it because you said just to depress your students, but the book itself, I mean, there doesn't appear to be a solution. And in fact, this seems to be uh, increasing in such a geometric fashion that what what's going to happen? What, what the heck is going to happen? I, I'm not sure exactly how things are, are going to develop. I... I, I but I think it's illusory to think that there's any way we can turn back the clock. Right. Things have changed. Things are changing, for both the better and the worse. Um, and my, my book talks mostly about the worse. And I think the what I'm hoping will happen is that people will become savvier about their information. They'll be smarter about figuring out where sources are and what their problems are, their, their biases, um, questioning uh, the information that they're fed through their digital sensorium, um, being a little bit more skeptical of consumers of information. And uh, I think that's the way we as a species are going to have to evolve. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be allowing people to use our new sense, uh, our, our telesense that's uh, enhanced by the uh, uh, Internet, uh, that if we allow people to uh, manipulate it, that we are being controlled by them, allowing them to control us. Another aspect is that the networks, you talk about that a little bit, um, the television itself is going by the wayside because you take someone like Justin Bieber, who was discovered essentially on the internet, and then my daughter, my 16-year-old, there's this girl named Bethany Moda, and um, when she was 14, she did one video of her in her room about fashion. And then she got bigger and bigger and bigger until she had millions and millions of followers and lots of ads on her YouTube channel. And then she just sold, she just got her own line of clothing at Aeropostal, and my daughter just bought six outfits <laughs> that are Bethany Moda outfits. And it's almost like you can, you can become a star. You can become a star, and it starts with really nothing at all. She was 14. Yeah, and it's... <laughs> There's incredible power here because Amazing power. Anything, anything you say, anything you post, you go into Twitter, the world can see it. It is out there. Almost, I mean, the, the reach you have now, uh, it's, it's as if every time you utter something, it echoes around the world. You have to say things that people want to listen to uh, or at least gawk at. Um, but... The potential is there like never before, and so that is, is a wonderful thing. But it's, it's also it's also a scary thing because you are exposed in a way that you've never been before. That in some ways, that anything you post on the internet is obviously not private, but people are integrating so much of their life uh, into internet uh, devices, into internet websites, that in some ways we're we're entering a, a post-privacy society, that everything we do, a good proportion of our everyday lives, is accessible to complete strangers halfway around the world. It's like, it's like kids joining up anything through Facebook. And it even says, we are going to take everything you own. It says, if you sign up here, we're going to take your profile, we're going to take your friends, we're going to take every site. And they still sign up through Facebook because I think people just expect there is no privacy anymore. And to a certain extent, you have to live as if you live in a glass house, and I think that will increase because, it, you know, it, it just seems like it's doubling every year. One thing that really struck me and was really scary and I think very wrong is when Carl Icahn was fighting with Apple, and then he started tweeting things about Apple and what he was going to do. And that must have made him a ton of money, and it certainly affected his fight. And I thought, this is really wrong that he's doing this, but... There's no, there's no regulatory authority at all that can stop any of this stuff. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, unless you get uh, across the line of insider trading, right? Then, then you're, you can do anything you want. And this is one of the amazing things about information: it has value on its own. You can create it out of nothing. And if you're smart, you can create stock rumors and cr have the stock market move uh, by information that you create and make lots of money based upon those movements. And so uh, there's a great incentive out there that, that you can actually use information in various ways to make money, and some of these ways are 
great that benefit people, and some of these ways are parasitic. And uh, all of these uh, parasites and, and uh, information creators are battling it out uh, in, in these uh, wars that we barely are aware of. Uh, and part of what I'm, I'm hoping that people figure out is that we are subject to these wars. Just be, be aware of what's waging around us, and uh, uh, that way you'll be able to defend yourself against the things you don't want uh, to affect you. Well, that's a big assumption. And I guess, you know, the book has been enormously praised, but the ones who have reviewed it in a somewhat negative fashion are talking about you as if you're a naysayer. And it's not that at all. You're just pretty objective in the book. Nothing you say. And and, and by your footnotes alone, it's clear that you have done the work that you hoped would be done by reporters today. But the people, some people who read the book look at it as if you're saying this is the end of the world. And it, it's, oh, no. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's the beginning of a completely new era in the same way that, that, that the printing press is the beginning of a new era. It changes the landscape. And, and if there's nothing that uh, we humans do, we, we are adaptable creatures. Uh, and we're very good at altering our own landscape and adapting to it and changing things for the better. And I think the Internet is a gigantic change like that. And anyone who's lived in the era of card catalogs hmm. uh, knows that there's so much more out there that we can reach easily from the comfort of our own home. Um, uh, I, I don't think anyone wants to go back to those days. Um, so I, I'm not an internet naysayer. It's made everyone's life easier and better in many, many, many ways. Uh, it just has these unforeseen consequences, and we should just see them. You know, it's like that saying about a, a year in real life is a day in the internet and even since you wrote the book I think the number of which 60 billion uh, I think there's more tweets than that I think has increased since you've written the book don't you think so? Oh yeah yeah the, and developments are happening day by day the, the Facebook uh, was pilloried for having a, a its experiment and they've yeah. apologized and uh, I mean, there's there's an exponential growth to these things, and in fact, this this comes. I think um, the what ruled the world in Sil or what ruled Silicon Valley uh, from oh seventies to maybe the nineties was Moore's law. You know that law where where uh, the power of computers right. doubles every every uh, eighteen months, or or the price halves, um, which still holds. Which still holds. But I think the real p driving force behind Silicon Valley changed in the 90s to Metcalfe's law, which says that the, the power of a network grows as the uh, square of the number of people in the network. And everyone in Silicon Valley realizes that the faster you build your networks, uh, the more value there will be in them. And so you don't even necessarily have to know what your network will do or what value it, it has to begin with. You just build it and get it big enough, and it has value on its own. And that's how Google uh, built its value. It's, it's got a, a huge network of people who use it and information about those users. Twitter, Facebook. Um, you can look even at 23andMe, which is the, the genome sequencing uh, uh, startup. Uh, all of these places build their value by gathering people to them. And by gathering people to them, they get more people to gather to them. And whatever value they can extract from it, they do. Yeah, and, uh, you know, you have companies like Mobile or Exxon that used to be the biggest market caps, and now companies like – look, Zuckerberg bought that – basically a chat app for $19 billion. Yeah. You know, probably had six employees and no revenue. Still has no revenue. <laughs> well, you know, and, and, and this harkens back to the uh, – late 90s or early 2000s where you, you everyone talks about an internet bubble and that's this i mean valuation of something which is intangible is really really difficult and that's another thing about the information era is is the old ways of valuing something having a scarcity uh, having a tangible product that you had to ship and move uh those aren't the only ways of making money anymore and these intangibles, these uh, informational things are becoming an increasingly large part of our, uh, our economy. And when you've got something which is copyable and isn't scarce, <laughs> economists really don't know how to, how to uh, make sure that we pay for the, what, what the value is.
I know it's like how Warren Buffett said he never invested in any of this stuff because he simply didn't understand it. And I can appreciate that philosophy because trying to wrap your head around this piece of software that is theoretically worth it, 19 billion, because he paid for it and they accepted it. So it's a, a clear transaction that was based on perception of value. Um, but I don't see it. Either I'm too dumb to see it or I just can't understand it. Uh, I don't even know which one it is anymore. That's how confusing it is. Yeah, it's not even necessarily a, a, a value based on perception. It's a value based on a perception of people's perception. So you you can crawl down this infinite cycle where where you're it's it's a game where you're you're no longer worried about what the company inherently is worth or what people think it's worth. And if they're really smart, you think of what people think of what people think it's worth. It's really actually what the perception of the future is. And it's a future that's, you don't even know what the future is. Is it six months? Is it a year? Is it 10 years? It doesn't make any difference anymore. Um, but, I, I, you know, I could talk about all this stuff for hours, and, and I, I didn't mean to take up all of your time on this, but it, it just, um, all of your books have attempted, in my mind, to explain things to people that they otherwise either wouldn't have understood or would never think of. So what, what's in your, to, in, to, in closing, what's in your mind when you decide, all right, I'm going to explain what zero really means, why it's so crucial to understand why this cipher, if you will, makes our lives kind of work in a way. So what gives rise in your mind? Are you just sitting around doing a thought experiment like Einstein? Or do you just say, you know, I wish people understood this the way I did? It's, uh, there's an aha moment that, precedes most of my books on some level that, that you you uh, are working with a concept and all of a sudden it, 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 it crystallizes and with something like zero uh, I, I was trained as a mathematician and uh, very quickly when you're training in mathematics you start dealing with some very abstruse complex topics like like infinity and infinity in several different forms and different levels and looking at how this number system works on, on uh, very complex ways. And the aha moment came realizing uh, that really to understand the complexity of it it, 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 it all has to do with the uniqueness of the number at the origin. Um, and so uh, for me, sharing uh, this aha moment is the, mo uh, is the motivation uh, for most of my books, and and uh, for for virtual and reality was very much the, the the aha moment was realizing how how this double edged sword that people were praising the the information the the value of digital information and where everyone was talking about the negatives in different ways, but no one had kind of talked about it as a property of the digital medium. Uh, similarly with proofiness, the uh, I, I work with hmm. mathematics all the time, and yet understanding the power that it is you that uh, of mathematics as it's abused, um, seeing that made me want to kind of tell people about it and, and give them the same aha moment that I had. That's a great answer. Thanks. I mean, thank you so much for coming here today and and uh, explaining. Uh, why we are where we are it's, it's a great book um you know i have a bookstore an independent bookstore and it's on our front shelf and um you know if you ever get to the philadelphia area or just outside please come by we'd love to have you there for a signing oh, i'd love to drop by great thank you well it was a pleasure talking to you and um, um your next book like i said we'd be glad to talk again absolutely my pleasure this was quite a fun interview that was charles seif talking about his book virtual on reality just because the internet told you, how do you know it's true? Um, and the answer is, there's no way. Um, it, it, you know, I understand what he's saying about people smartening up, getting more attuned to what's real and what's fake, but I can't see, and I would tell him this too, I can't see how we're going to get smart enough uh, to be able to discern the difference between truth, truth and falsity um, in this new world, in this new essentially world. It's a different reality than the one that we have waking up when we get dressed and walk down the street. This is completely different. <clears throat> and speaking of completely different, next week we're going to be hosting um, Mandy Aftel, who 
is discussing her latest book, Fragrant, The Secret Life of Scent. It's kind of a off for me, but it's a, I thought, you know, this is going to be about perfume and all. It's not. It's about, uh, I guess, the epic of aroma and, you know, what it is that creates smell and, and why it's so important to us, you know, why it's so evocative, why when you think of burning leaves, does it raise all these memories of Halloween or walking with your dad or taking your dog for a walk, but it's very evocative. And in fact, I just, I just read um, of a study that portends an early death for people uh, in correlation to their loss of the sense of smell. So I was thinking, based on my blue eyes, my left-handedness, the fact that my mother never put sunscreen on us when we were kids, I mean, who did? So we got horrible sunburns at an early age. My uncle was a dentist and gave me and my brother vials of mercury to play with. And my increasing inability to differentiate odors, I should have been dead 20 years ago. So anyway, on that note, we'll end. And hopefully, I'll be around next week to interview Ms. Aftel um, regarding her book, Fragrant. So thanks so much, as always, for joining us here. And we look forward to talking with you and talking with uh, um, our author next week. You've been listening to the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will be back next week with reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today. 